the title of my talk is Embrace the Database with Ecto. Um, this is some version of a talk I'm going to give in a couple weeks in, at Elixir Days. Yeah, that conference. Um, so yeah, I'm excited to hear what you all think at the end. Uh, so a little bit about me. My name is Josh Branshaw. I'm a software developer here at HashRocket, hence the, the HashRocket t-shirt. Um, I'm originally from Nebraska, but I've lived in Chicago for like three years now. I have two cats. I don't know, is there anything else you want to know about me? Perfect. Ooh, I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you. Um, cool. So I have some opinions about databases. Probably a lot of these opinions have uh, developed through my time here at HashRocket, through lots of conversations with um, smart people here. So I'm going to share some of those opinions with you. Um, my first opinion is that the database is your friend. Do, what do people think about that? Do you all feel like the database is your friend? But yeah? The right database is your friend. Raise your hand if, if you love the database. If the database is your favorite thing. Love. A few people? <laughs> okay. I like it. A few people. Love friend, being friends to being in love. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's... Yeah. 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 Uh, but databases are scary, right? So may maybe maybe you don't like databases because uh, there's like weird things like composite indexes and full outer joins and common table expressions and sometimes you have to like do explain and analyze to figure out performance issues. Um, so databases can be scary, but uh, there, there's a lot you can do with the database. Um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot that a database can give you that uh, maybe your application can't give you. And so I, I want to encourage you to think of the database as your friend. Um, also, the database is not just a dumb data store, right? It, it's a powerful... That, well, yeah. Um, <laughs> it is a powerful computation engine, um, at least the database that I'm talking about. Um, my third opinion is that the data stored in your database is the single most important asset in the life of your product or business. Uh, your code uh, comes and goes, right? Your application was written in PHP once, now it's in Rails. Maybe you're rewriting it in Elixir now, uh, but your data is still always there. Maybe it changes, maybe you add to it, maybe you transform it, but like that's essential to your business and your product. So it's important, you want to take care of it. Um, and then my last opinion that I want to share is that um, the best database for web applications is PostgreSQL. Um, so yeah, I can't speak to Mongo, but um, I'm, I'm pretty fired up about PostgreSQL and I think it can be your friend, it's my friend. So here's the agenda for the talk. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about data integrity, right, so the data is the most important thing, um, most important asset, so we wanna take care of our data, we wanna make sure our data is right, so I'm gonna talk about data integrity. Uh, we're going to look at schemaless queries, how we can build up queries. Um, I think Ecto is a really fun DSL for doing that. Um, Ecto can't do everything, though, so we're going to look at Ecto's escape hatch, how we can get into some of the features of um, our database that we wouldn't otherwise be able to with Ecto. And then we'll see how we can enhance Ecto with custom functions. So in order to do all of that, we're going to need uh, some sample data. Jake already gave you an introduction to uh, the Today I Learned application, so I won't spend too much time on that. Um, but that, the, I pulled down a copy of the production database from this app. It's been around for about a year and a half or so, so there's a good amount of data for, for a presentation like this. And uh, just as a reminder, TIL is an open source project by the team here at HashRocket. Um, it uh, catalogs the sharing and accumulation of knowledge that happens day to day. Right? So when we're pairing and we learn something cool from the person we're pairing with, we're like, oh, I should write a TIL about that. And then we do. And it's all at til.hashrocket.com. So check that out uh, you know, after the talk. So the, there's more than this going on in TIL's uh, database schema, but these are things I want to focus on for the purposes of this talk. So we have posts, we have developers, and we have channels. Um, posts are the things that we write, that's the, the content of, of the website. Um, developers, that's like me and Dorian and other people at HashRocket, we're the ones who write the posts, so there's, um, right, developers have many posts. And then there's channels, those are kind of the categories that posts fall into, so channels have many posts as well. 
Um, this is the post table as it exists today in the Rails application. We don't need to concern ourselves with all of it, but um, I think some of the interesting things to point out, uh, right, we have a developer ID, we have a channel ID, so those are um, supported by foreign keys and that's how we relate to those uh, developer and channel table. Um, we have the body and the title, which are the content, and then um, we also have likes, so that's like how many times a post has been liked, right? Because there's um, a favoriting feature, an upvoting feature on the site. Um, we also have a developers table, right? We can see this reference here that I just pointed out that it's being referenced by the post table. Um, developers have like email, username, other kinds of metadata. And then we have the channels table. So these are things like uh, channels like the Elixir channel, the Ruby channel, the Vim channel. Um, and that's dictated by the name. And again, the ID is referenced through a foreign key on the post table. So like I said, this, uh, this application has been around for over a year and a half. Um, it's got a bunch of data in it. It's, it's essentially a, a pile of data, a pile of answers, just like waiting to be asked the right question. And um, the way we uh, ask questions of our data is, is like the topic of this talk, right? So, I mean, we, we can chat and say like, what are the, how many developers are in the application? Or um, what are the most liked posts of 2016 or something like that? But um, we need to be able to convey those questions to, the, um, to our database or to our application. Um, and in order to do that, we need a mediator. So my question is, uh, what's the best mediator between us and our data? SQL, right? SQL is the best way to talk to our SQL database. Um, I do believe that's true. Maybe I should have included that in my opinions. Um, right? Like we just say, we want to know how many posts there are. Well, we just select a count from the post table. And we see that there's just over a thousand posts. Um, but I'm pulling your legs a little bit because uh, this is an Elixir meetup and we want to talk about Elixir and Ecto. So actually, Ecto is a pretty cool way to interact with the database, a pretty cool way to ask questions of our data, and we're going to explore that now. Um, so if you don't already know, Ecto is a domain-specific language uh, for writing queries and for interacting with databases in Elixir. So that, qu that question we just asked a moment ago, how many posts are there in our database, uh, we, we can ask that again here with, um, with Ecto. We say, we say from our post table, select the count of the IDs, or you, know, you could say select the count of, of any column name. And then you wrap it in this repo.1 function, which is what actually so that this part inside the parentheses, that just constructs our query, and then repo.1 is what actually sends it and has to execute against our database. Um, so I guess the point I want to make here is queries are just data. right? The, this thing in, inside the parentheses, that, that's just like a data structure. It's, it's, an, it's an Elixir struct. Um, and so the cool thing about queries is data, um, right, is you can build them up as you go. You can like pipe them through. Uh, they're, Right, they're like immutable things like we do with any sort of structure in, uh, in Elixir. And then um, because they're structs, we, we can inspect them. So we can see like what's the state of this um, query right now? What's the, you know, what are the joins on this query so far? What, what's the select statement on this query look like? You know, at any point in our application, we, we can inspect that stuff. So the, the first item on the agenda was to talk about data integrity. Um, your database is the ultimate gatekeeper. Uh, and so what I mean by that is that um, right, we, we want to protect our data. We want to make sure that the data that we're letting into our database is like the right data. We don't want um, like data that just has a bunch of holes in it getting into our database. And our database should be in charge of that. Um, right, like a database might have many different clients attached to it. Uh, you might have different like microservices that you've built that stick different, you know, interact with certain APIs and stick pieces of data in your into your database. So um, if you have if you're having like 
application level validations, but you also have all these clients where you're going to have to duplicate those across all of your, you have to duplicate those validations across all of your clients, across all of your microservices. Um, and certainly there, there's, there's great reasons to use app level validations, but first and foremost, you need to have uh, database level validations. Um, and that, that's the way to dry it up, right? Dry it up, like don't repeat yourself. Uh, if you put you know, the right kinds of constraints uh, in your database, then there, there's a lot less you have to worry about. So the first kind of data integrity I want to talk about is just enforcing particular data types. Right, you can say like this column is a string, this one's an integer, this one's a boolean. That that's a form of like data validation. Um, and depending on our database, in particular with Postgres, we can use um, all kinds of like better custom data types uh, as they're available. So like Postgres has support for UUID just baked in. It has support for different kinds of um, numeric types like big int if you need to store really large numbers. Um, and then you can also pull in extensions that are readily available, like the CI text extension, which allows you to store case insensitive um, text data, like if you're storing email addresses. You don't care whether it's uppercase or lowercase, so just store it with CI text. Um, and here's what that looks like in, uh, with an Ecto migration. Right, so you might have to execute a create extension statement to use the CI text extension, and then the actual create table uh, the declaration, right, we, we say we don't want a primary key because we're going to create our own that uses the UUID and we declare as a primary key and then we can like declare an email field as CI text. So those are just a couple examples of how you can declare the per particular data type of, of the fields in, in your database. So the second kind of uh, thing we can enforce is we can enforce the presence of something using not null constraints. Uh, I'm of the opinion that everything should like start with a, like a not null constraint, like it's you cannot make this column null, and then you like remove that like as needed. Um, I, I think that's a good like general rule. Uh, far too often I see applications that just everything's nullable and there's nothing telling you that you're just like not putting data in when you should be. So just start with everything not null. Uh, another kind of thing that we want to enforce is uh, relationships, right? So we already talked about foreign key constraints. Uh, we can see an example of that here with our, um, with our creating our post table or some smaller version of our post table, right? We, we add the developer ID and we say it references the developer's table and then we specify the type because we already said it was a UUID. These this kind of statement uh, creates a foreign key constraint. And what that means is that when, um, when, when there's a post pointing at Dorian saying Dorian wrote me, like you can't just like delete Dorian from the database without the post or the database itself like complaining like saying, hey, there's these posts here that point to Dorian. So first kill all these posts and then you can... I mean, it, de it depends on what you want to do. Yeah, if, if you want to kill all the posts and then, and then wipe Dorian as well, like you can do that. Um, but it, it's nice when your database is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like, are you sure you want to delete that? Because you're about to orphan um, a bunch of references that are like pointing all over the place. Um, so we can get that sort of uh, we can get that enforced by including foreign key constraints. And then, lastly, uh, you can enforce more general kinds of relationships with check constraints. Uh, one that we you might have noticed earlier when we were looking at the post table is um, because you can only upvote posts, you can't like downvote them. Uh, our, our likes column should at, at the least be zero. It should, it should always be a, you know, a positive value or greater than zero. So we create this constraint called on the post table called ensure positive likes and it, the check that it does is that the likes is always greater than or equal to zero. Um, that's not a particularly interesting example but you can imagine uh, you can uh, you know, assert different sorts of things about like relationships between different columns in a table. Now you can't do like uh, cross table check constraints, unfortunately, but um, you know, there's application level ways of doing that, I suppose. So this is just kind of like everything I wrote for 
those series of slides, like the, this is the full migration, like the, the full up migration um, with a bit more added in. There, there's some interesting bits in here, like using the fragment function, setting defaults, uh, yeah, that, that sort of thing. And, and we'll dig into more of that a little bit later. And then, of course, you, if you're writing an up migration, you need a down migration. So that, that would be like dropping the tables and then dropping the extensions that we created. So now we'll move into the schemaless queries section. Right, so we've already seen a schemaless query earlier in this talk. Uh, right, we did this. Uh, we selected the count of all the posts in the table. Uh, so the, the thing with queries is we're, we're always going to start with a from clause. Like you'll always see a from clause. And in a lot of cases, when we're writing seamless queries, like instead of referencing the module of, a, of an ecto schema, uh, we're referencing just a string which represents the name of the table in our database. The database is literally called posts, and so that's what that string is, is referring to. Um, yeah, and then, so it, it always starts with from, that's like the function, and then there's like a series of like key, keyword arguments that follow that allow you to define other uh, attributes of the, the query, or other clauses of the query. Um, we'll use things like repo.1, repo.all, um, et cetera, to, to execute our queries against the database, and then just a quick note that uh, for all of the examples that we're looking at, I've like run import ecto.query. That's what's needed for, for all that goodness. And then I've also aliased my app.repo, um, which as Jake explained, just exposes the repo um, binding so that I can just say like repo.1. So what are some other questions that we can ask? Right, we already asked how many uh, posts are there, so maybe we want to know how many developers are there. And we have a query that looks pretty similar to the one before. Here you can see we take advantage of this fragment uh, function, which... What does fragment do? Yeah, I'm going to talk about that. Um, Maybe may it's a little bit of a teaser, but uh, <laughs> what, what, it, what it results in is us saying, like, select count from the developers table, and we see that we have 32 developers. Um, yeah, did, did that make sense otherwise? Mm -hmm. Cool. So uh, maybe a slightly more interesting question we might want to ask is uh, how many posts by channel are there? Right, like in each channel, what what is what are the number of posts we have for each channel? Um, so in order to answer that question, uh, we're going to start with uh, like joining channels, the channels table onto the post table. And so again, we we start with a from clause or with the from function and Posts, I guess, is the subject, so we'll just say that from P and posts. Right, and so here we're creating a binding. So now P references like the, the post table, and so that's a binding we can use later in our query. Um, and then we use a join clause to say we want to join in the channels table, and we're going to bind it to C. And then um, if you're familiar with SQL, right, there's an on clause, which says like on, on like what uh, conditions are we like joining the table. And so or joining those two tables. And so we join them when the channel ID on the posts table matches the, the channel ID itself. And so we, we've now constructed a partial query. If we were to run like repo.all on this, it would yell at us. It would say, you don't have a select uh, declared. But it's something, right? We've created this like piece of uh, the structure, the struct that uh, has some data in it that we can continue to build on. And we've called it, we've bound it to posts and channels. So what's the next step? Well, uh, we can use group by with um, a count of the post IDs as our aggregator. And so what that looks like is right, we, we created that binding posts and channels. So now we can use that as, um, as the subject of our from. And we can use a list of the um, a list of bindings, right? So this will bind to the post table and this will bind to the channel table because of the, uh, them both being joined in in that previous partial query. And so then we group by the names. So anything that has the same name will be grouped together. So all the elixir things will be grouped together. And then anything that we want to select on that's not included in the group by, 
needs to be aggregated in some way. So we aggregate them with a count. So all of the posts that are uh, have the Elixir channel will aggregate together into a count, which is the, the number of posts in that channel. And when we run repo.all on that, we, we see the results, right? We have 13 closure posts. We have 125 Ruby posts. Uh, this is kind of a mess, though, so we can make one improvement. We can clean up the results with an order by clause, where we say order by, in descending order, the count of the post IDs. And that'll, you know, give us from most to fewest posts in each channel. So we can see we have a lot of Vim posts, not very many Erlang posts. We're pretty excited about Elixir, so it's up there. One thing to notice is that the output of the select, the data structure that I can choose is anything. So I could be a double, it could yeah. be like mm -hmm. an array or whatever. Yeah, so here we, we're wrapping so it. On that. Yeah, we're wrapping it in a tuple so that we see all the results are tuples. Uh, we could wrap it in a map and then all the results would um, you know, have keyword mappings. Um, you would probably do a lot fancier stuff too, I imagine. Nice truck, whatever. Yeah, yeah, cool. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, question. So on the from, you have a first item is a list, mm -hmm. PNC. Um, that's mapping to what you get from posting channels, right? It's not... Like it doesn't know about the PNC that you find in posting No, post right. The, channels, the, the PNC right? could have been... Yes, different and, letters and in, in, how, the, in posting channels. How do you? How's it? How's the definition of what of what comes back from that? Like, how do you know that the P is post? Does that happen to be first in posting channels? Yeah, it it will enforce ordering. Okay. Yeah. So if if you were to like. Okay. Yeah. If. Um, yeah, it knows the ordering. Like you, you can call these bindings whatever you want, but you have to know that the second thing is going to be channels and. If you think it's not channels, you're going to be disappointed when your query blows up. <laughs> Is it channels because that you join like channels to posts yeah. or like you post and then yeah, because the channels was the yeah, join. That's post. the second thing, and if you were to join a third thing, mm -hmm. then based on that ordering, that third thing would you be what it me. is. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, here's another question: How many posts on average per developer? Uh, so this is a little more complicated of a query. So first, let's uh, get the post count for each developer. So uh, these are probably starting to look uh, kind of familiar. Right? We're having some of the same uh, things showing up again and again. So we're, we're looking at the post table as our subject. We're grouping by the developer ID. That way we can aggregate all the um, developers, all the posts by developers. And then again, we select the post count, we aggregate on the, the count of the IDs and then the developer ID. And uh, what's your name? Pedro. Pedro? Yeah. Uh, as Pedro mentioned, uh, yeah, we can use anything here. Here I decide to use a map and then we're able to name these arguments. And that comes in really handy in this uh, next piece. And just real quick, I'll point out, you can see that that's encoded in the struct. And then the reason it's handy that we use the map is because in this next piece, um, oh, okay, yeah, so that, um, got ahead of myself. So the, uh, if we were just called repo.all on post count right now, we would see, um, right, just this bunch of output. For each developer, it tells us the, the number of posts they have, but we, we want to know the average over all developers. So we have to take our query one step further. And to do that, uh, we wrap um, our post count in a subquery. And the reason it's important that we um, used a map in post counts is now we're uh, able to, yeah, if you can see here, Oh yeah, here we go. So, um, so because we wrapped it in a map and we uh, those keys that we gave in that map, 
are then used um, as aliases in the query. So there's an as developer ID and a as post count. And that's what allows us in, um, once we're outside of a subquery, to like reference something that was in that subquery. So when we do, uh, when we use the aggregate function, we say we want the average. Well, the average of what? Well, we can say the average of post count, which is a reference to that post count that, uh, that this piece got uh, alias to. Does that make sense? Yeah. And then Find we see. the average developer and, and every month shame whoever is the average so that everybody finds Yeah, it. we're all about shaming at HashRocket, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll look into that. Um, that. This should be a feature. Yeah, yeah that our, sounds our like a, the next feature. So the, the, the results come out to about 36 uh, posts per developer on average. And then just a couple notes about the aggregate function. It's kind of cool. Uh, it has a couple different, uh, I guess, atoms you can use with it. There's average, count, max, min, sum. Right, so the, we counted the posts earlier with, uh, with like a select statement, but we could just as easily count the posts this way by saying, give me the aggregate of posts counting the, counting the IDs, and it does the same query. It gives us 1066 like we had before. So we've been looking at uh, a lot of schemaless queries, and we're going to try something just a bit more complex to really kind of drive it home. So the question I want to ask now is, what is the channel and title of each developer's most liked post in 2016? So there's a lot going on there. And the thing with uh, complex queries, whether we're writing them in Ecto or whether we're just in a peaceful session writing them in SQL, um, I, I think that's key, is we, we want to like build our solution from the ground up. And, we want to build it piece by piece. So hopefully we'll see a little bit of what that looks like here in this example. So first, we know that we need um, channels. We need uh, posts because of the title of the post. And then it's based on each developer. So we need, to, we need the developers table as well. So we have to join all of those together. And you can see that we start with the post table. We join in developers and we join in channels. This is the sort of thing we've been seeing. Does that look good? Cool. Next, uh, we want to uh, combine the order by and distinct uh, clauses, I guess is what you would call them. Um, so yeah, again, we, we have that explicit ordering from the post devs channels uh, thing that we defined in the previous thing, right? We started with posts, then developers and channels. So in this next piece, it has to be post developers channels. Um, and so we use distinct to say, we want to be distinct on the developer ID. So even if there's like 10 posts by some, by, by Dorian, it's, it's only going to take like one of them. And which one though? Well, like the first one that it encounters. And since it's the first one that it encounters, we're going to want an order by clause to make sure that it's the most liked post that is the first one it encounters. So we have order by descending posts likes. Um, so by using order by and distinct together, we get things in the right order and then we trim out all the extra and we're left with just one for each developer, the most liked one. And then fr from there we can select uh, the developer by the developer's username, the channel of that post and the title of that post. And we can see the resulting query here. Uh, I guess one thing that's interesting is distinct has an implicit ordering, which is ascending ordering with the developer ID. I suppose you could set that to descending if you wanted uh, to like also order the developers by, by their ID, but that's not really pertinent here. So we're really close, but we need to constrain our results to the year 2016, because this application spans more than, this application now has posts, I think, in 2015, 2016, and 2017. So uh, that's cool, but we, we want to trim it down to just 2016. So we're going to add two where clauses. Right, the first one says um, the creation date of the posts has to have been after um, you know January 1st, 2016, and then the creation date also has to be um, before January 1st, 2017. And um, we can see those where's appearing here in our 
query struct, and um, that should do it. So if we run that with repo.all, we'll see the results. Right, so developer2 has um, an Elixir post that was their most popular, and it's called invoke Elixir functions with apply. And there's one with Vim and Ruby and another with Ruby. So um, some other like schemaless query functions that were introduced in Ecto 2.0 are um, update all, insert all, and delete all. I'm not going to go into the details of those during this talk, but uh, there's a really cool uh, PDF, like kind of mini book, released about Ecto 2 by uh, Plataforma Tech, however you say the name. Um, yeah. And it talks about this stuff and a lot of other things in, in uh, 2.0, so ch check that out if you have a chance. So I mentioned uh, there's an escape hatch, and I think somebody asked about, you know, what's that uh, fragment function? So um, we're going to talk about that now. So Ecto can't do it all. Sometimes we need an escape hatch. Sometimes we need a way to, like, just call straight into whatever that database feature is that we want to use. Um, one way we can do that is with, like, one-off queries using Ecto's um, repo.query function. So here's an example of that, like, Postgres has a generate series function, so if I wanted to call that, I could just say repo.query and give it a raw string, and it would execute that. And I think it actually just calls into uh, Postgres to do that. And you can see the result. We get a series from one to five. Some other information about the, the other metadata is embedded in there as well. But uh, perhaps I think the more interesting piece are fragments. So ecto query API fragment function. And actually, there's um, a fragment function on the migrations module as well, which we saw earlier. So you can use it for things like uh, getting access to like Postgres's now function, or if we were to import PG Crypto, we, the PG Crypto extension, we could use the gen random UUID uh, function inside of Postgres as well. So that's a great way for setting defaults. Um, but as for using fragments and queries, but we saw something like that, we call fragment, we wrap it around count, and that just means we're going to use the Postgres's count function. Like, don't try and execute this in the context of Elixir, just like pass that like raw into my, into my query. And we can see the query it creates is just that. So to really see how this works, uh, we're going to revisit the query we were just looking at. Um, and we're, we're going to ask ourselves the question, like, can, can we use the between construct that um, SQL gives us? Right, because right now we have these two where statements, but maybe the way this query is written, it doesn't totally convey the intent of our question. Like, we're saying we want the published date of the post to be between this date and this date. And two separate where clauses maybe doesn't communicate that to another developer who looks at this later on. So let's uh, use fragment and take advantage of the between construct in Postgres. And so the way we, did I get a mouse cursor here? Oh yeah. So uh, we use some question marks to say like what we want interpolated. And then we just say, we want this thing to be between this other thing and this other thing. Uh, so the creation date, we want to be between the beginning of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. So that's easy enough. and. Uh, we can see that fragment embedded in our data here, in, in our struct. And yeah, that'll work. We could run that query again, and, and we would get the same results. Um, oh, Sorry. yeah. Wouldn't it make sense if you are jumping to, to Postgres to use Postgres's data? I was the same thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for sure. Yeah, so um, I did want to like Demonstrate. take advantage of the date time thing here, but. Yeah, if we were, um, yeah, if we really wanted to go all out, yeah, we could like, uh, Postgres has a lot of nice features for um, creating uh, like timestamp or date time objects. And um, so, yeah, we could have done that. So I want to take this example one step further, right? That, that fragment was a, maybe felt a little bit clunky or a little bit uh, kind of ugly, I guess. So we can get, I think, a little more elegant using custom functions. Right, so we can do a little bit better than this. And we do that by defining a custom function. So we'll have to do a little bit of metaprogramming, but not much. 
And so we create a custom functions module, whatever you want to call it. And this is a place where you can define all kinds of reusable fragments, right? Uh, between is probably something I'm going to want to use a lot in a large, long-running application. So I don't want to have to be like typing this stuff over and over again. I'd rather be able to use um, a between function uh, as part of like the Ecto Query API that does this fragment stuff for me. And so that's just what we do here. So we import our custom functions thing wherever we want to use it. And then, yeah, we can just say between the created at date of the post that it's between these two, the, you know, the beginning of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. And we can see that in our struct. And we'll get the same results. So that's it. That's uh, all I wanted to cover in this talk. Uh, thank you for listening. Are, are there any questions? Yeah. Um, well, the, the question marks you've got there uh, in, in that one, yeah, are, those, uh, are those question marks actually interpolated by a mixer, or are those question marks being handed off to Postgres and then run the query optimizer and then bound to variants and pass it in? That is a great question. Uh, I think. Right. So these are all being executed as like prepared statements. So I think, yeah, maybe yeah, there's yeah. some like munging of what whether that's actually a question mark or not. But I, I think they are passed in as a list to a prepared statement. That's like you decide the actor. That's the that'll be the wrapper. You always work with an adapter. In this case, it's Postgres. Postgres know how to pass the data and dump the data and pull data to to Postgres. So that replacement will happen in the adapter. Does that does that for you? Which kind of like JDBC, right? Sure, sure. Which would, which probably means that the Postgres is actually doing the that the query is getting prepared before those values are getting inserted. I guess. Yeah. So that makes sense. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, I guess kind of what my, the other question that popped in my head here. So uh, this is all schemaless. So things like so so always doesn't actually know that devs has a username uh, and that right. channels has a name and mm -hmm. stuff like that, right? So most of the times that, that I've ever had to fight with uh, query like query objects or whatever, it's trying to help me by doing static type analysis on you know on my, my tables and columns and, and telling me that IDs can be joined, developer underscore ID can be joined meaningfully to you know to, to the developer dot ID field because they're the same type or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so that it's clearly not doing that here, right? Mm -hmm. So it doesn't actually know. Uh, and so I guess kind of my question is, what, what is the value that you've, you've experienced in converting from just a big blob of SQL? Because I mean, that's, that's functionally what we see here, right? Mm -hmm. The select distinct that's ID from blah, 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 order by. Like it's, it looks remarkably like SQL to me, just like right. with kind of different syntax. Like what, what benefit have you seen in using this mechanism as opposed to like just writing down a big string? Yeah, so I would say for, for like longer running applications, for large applications, you probably do want to use schemas, at least in, in most cases, like because of the benefits you just enumerated. Um, but for me, uh, why I found this fun or like interesting or useful it has been just for like exploring data. So like pulling down this, uh, this data set and being able to explore it with, um, without having to like go and create schemas was like really nice. And um, on top of that, because this looks so much like SQL, but also because it's not SQL, in some ways it was like easier to think about the queries I was trying to write and to like uh, manipulate them or to like create the partial queries and then uh, you know construct pieces of them to get together later on. So the, those are I guess kind of the benefits I found. Um, I'm also a big fan of just like putting. Uh, here docs of like raw SQL in my migrations instead of like using a DSL because like that's, that's SQL's already a great awesome. DSL. That, that do get shame. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, be don't be ashamed any longer. Yeah. You're Excellent. you're on the right side of history there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can you even mention offloading data validations to the base layer and not worrying about them inside your application? 
how would you like take a database error that might come up from the index violation and turn that into an actionable human friendly error message for the user? Yeah, so um, maybe I didn't spend enough time on that. Uh, I think you st should still have validations in your application. Um, because they're great for uh, catching things early and providing, um, you know, validation messages to your user or like responding in certain ways. Um, but I think like the first step should always be putting something on the database level. So that that was, I guess, the point I was trying to make. Yeah. Right. So and also the same constraints that you have in the migration, you can use in the change sets. So you can go to the database and get the same constraints when you're trying to add. Alone in a table or mm -hmm. trying to update. So the constraints is just not having database just for the migration, but also for manipulating data as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's always good to tell database kind of as much as you can about the data so it can optimize the queries against that. Mm -hmm. I know it sounds vague, but literally databases can do all kinds of weird stuff. Yeah, I mean, like, per performance issues is a whole other topic as far as, like, where to put indexes and, and things like that. And, um, yeah, that's certainly a consideration as well. Yeah. Uh, at the top of the uh, talk, you gave an opinion that uh, Postgres is the superior uh, mm -hmm. database. Uh, does, does that go work well with, like, Maria or, or, or the data stores as well? Or is Postgres sort of like... So it has... At least Ecto like 1.x had support for a lot of things, even like NoSQL stuff, um, and it's still, I mean, it still does in 2.0. But I think there might be some features of 2.0 that aren't as fully supported as uh, Postgres and MariaDB. Um, I made all of that up. <laughs> no, I, I think I read that somewhere, but I, I don't know the specifics. But yeah. It, it, it's fairly well supported across SQL and NoSQL stuff. Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>